So, hello, we are looking at philosophy and ethics, and in particular, the existence of God. And in this section, we're going to be asking lots of deep philosophical questions all about God and what God is and the existence of God, all that malarkey. Um, and of course, we can remember a lot of that, can't we? All, all the key stuff about God, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omniternal. No, sorry, that's just eternal, isn't it? Got carried away with the omnis there. Um, imminent, personal, transcendent, uh, perfect, perfectly good. The idea of God as a judge, the idea of God as a father. All those key terms that come into play when we ask ourselves a question, what is God like? What's he like? What is he like? And one of the first things we've got to remember is this whole business of God the Trinity. Three in one, Trinity. Here we have God the Father, uh, represented here by Daddy Pig. And God the Son, there's a particularly gorgeous blue-eyed looking Jesus. That was meant to be God patting Jesus like a, a paternal father patting a son, but it didn't work out quite quite how I hoped it would. So you've got two parts of the Trinity there, God the Father, God the Son, and the third part is God the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And this Trinity thing, that's a mainstay of Christian belief. Um, you ask most Christians about the Trinity, they'll, they'll know what you're talking about. They'll, they'll be able to tell you about that. But there are some slight divergences within Christianity, some slightly different Trinity beliefs. Um, take Unitarians, for instance. Unitarians, woo, Unitarians with the opinion that the Spirit and God the Father are pretty much the same thing. But God the Son, Jesus, no, they don't see Jesus as quite as special as God. Jesus, of course, still very important to them, but not quite as special. Then you've got Jehovah's Witnesses who have very similar beliefs. They believe they believe that it's obvious that Jesus isn't as special as God the Father because Jesus wasn't eternal. He didn't last forever. He got killed off. Uh, spoiler. Um, whereas the spirit they see as the, the, the means of God using his power, like the spirit is is the conduit, the, the channel through which God's energy runs between God and the rest of the world. God works through the spirit. But generally in the Western church you have this idea of of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit being present in both God the Father and God the Son. Um, it does say in John chapter 1 that all things are made through the Son, that whole word business, the word up bit in John chapter 1. Whereas the Eastern Orthodox churches they tend to see the, the spirit really only emanating from God the Father, not from Jesus. So you have got some slight divergences with regards to interpretation of the concept of Trinity throughout the, the Christian tradition. But most would agree that they see God as this creator God. Um, no matter which Genesis creation story you look to, it's this idea of a powerful God who who creates, who moulds and creates the, the universe before him. Whether you're looking at the six day creation story with its nice logical steps, day one, create this, day two, create that, day three, bit the other and so on. I mean, you're looking there at a God who is in total control. Um, he, he just has to say stuff and it appears. What kind of power is that? That is amazing. Um, everything is good, God says, you know, and it is good. That's reiterated throughout that whole six day creation story. And let's face it, God can't do bad. Um, and he creates out of nothing. No raw materials, just says it and it's there. 
And of course, the idea that humans are like God's fish fingers, humans are created last um, and humans are the most important creation. So just as we save our fish fingers to last when we've got chips and fish fingers and peas for our tea, we, we get rid of the peas first, then we eat the chips and finally we save those special fish fingers to last. That's exactly what God did with humans. Now we can read into that a lot about the relationship between God and the world. God has created this world. Um, he would feel like a father to it. And when you feel fatherly towards something, you're protective of it. You love it dearly. Mm -hmm, you're proud of it. Look at what I have done on six days. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of Christians say the world is so beautiful to look at. Obviously, they've not been to Swindon. But other than that, you know, they, they can see beauty around them and they say, look, this is direct evidence of, of God's, God's love for the world because he's made it so beautiful. Then there's this idea of God's love for humanity, um, because God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God has created humanity to be just like him. That, that's a very loving thing to do isn't it if I really loved somebody I'd want to make them just like me um, and this picture I think is amazing because it shows God with that incredible bit of love on his face and and loving eyes reaching out to man reaching out to Adam desperately trying to get to touch Adam's hand with his pointy finger and he's, he's nearly there. And Adam just like can't be bothered. Adam's like, yeah, all right. Yeah, when you're ready, mate. Yeah. Um, that that picture in, in itself says much about the idea of a relationship between God, who is perfect, and humans, who just ain't. But let's not forget, humans are God's fixed fingers. He made us last, according to the Bible. God created humans last. That makes humans special in his eyes, and they always will be special, even if, like Adam here, they're not really putting the effort in. And you want evidence of how loving God is towards human beings? Just just look in the Bible, because it's all there. Um, God performs lots of miracles for humans to help them. Um, he gives them a promised land. Uh, he gives them a load of laws. Um he carves them specially into slabs for Moses, um, laws that will help them build good societies. He even gives them a way to sacrifice animals to keep him happy. That's very kind of God. And humans are just like, yeah, thanks, mate. Cheers. And of course, God being God, he knows none of that's actually going to work, that humans are still going to go off the rails. And <laughs> what does God do? Um... He creates a sun version of himself, blue, beautiful blue-eyed Jesus there, and sacrifices Jesus for humans. That's, that's a lot of effort that God's putting in to his relationship with human beings, with his fish fingers. And humans just don't seem that bothered, do they? Also, you've got this idea as God as a being who is outside time and space just totally beyond human understanding of existence trying to, to communicate with humans trying to, to keep that relationship alive so God's calling us and humans are just like a baby with a Fisher Price telephone not really knowing how to answer the call or even how to pick up the receiver so you've got some very nuanced aspects of uh, the relationship between God and humanity there. Uh, humanity is kind of like that slightly dodgy boyfriend who, no matter how much love you give them, they, they never really give it back fully. But you still can't help but love them. So moving on to the different arguments for the existence of God. Um, we'll start off with uh, the cosmological argument also known as the first cause argument. Um, cosmological comes from the word cosmos, meaning universe, duh. Um, and this is a really old argument. It goes back yonkies, dears, this one does. Um, 
and it is really kind of basic and simple. And it's based on the idea of cause and effect. It's what we call an a posteriori argument, which means it's based on evidence from behind us, in this case the existence of the universe. And if you've had any experience of life in the real world whatsoever, you will know, very simply, that nothing happens without something causing it to happen. And if you don't believe me, try now to think of anything that has happened without something causing it to happen. Go on, dare you! Exactly, you can't, can you? And what we understand is this, life is just one big domino rally. Everything that happens, happens because of something that's just happened before it, causing it to happen. And of course, that's something that just happened before it was also caused by something that happened before it, which was caused by something that happened before that, which was caused by something that happened before that. And before that, something happened causing that, which happened only because something happened to cause it to happen. And something caused that to happen. And so on and so on and so on, all the way back right to the beginning of the universe. So what started it all? Why did it start? What happened? What is behind it? Surely something must have caused the first thing to happen. Okay, you're comfortable down there, Tom? Yeah. Excellent. Right. This boy on the floor here, who is my son Tom, is about to get hit in the face by a book, one of these books here, that are lined up like so on the table. The question is, who is responsible for Tom getting hit and hurt very badly in the face by thud. What is going to happen is I'm going to touch this book here just a little bit and that book is then going to hit the Lady of the Rivers which will then hit Why Mummy Drinks which will then hit thud which will then hit Tom's face. Tom will then say, ow, and cry a lot. Hey. Well, no, you will. It'll hurt. Okay. So the question is, who is responsible? Okay. <clears throat> Here goes. Are you ready, Tom? Yeah. Three. Let me just... Uh, three. Two. One. Here it comes. Ooh. Oh, Tom, I saved you. I saved you just. But... Had I not been there, Tom, this book, third, this very heavy book, would have smacked you in the face. Okay? Yeah. The question is, who's responsible? Whose fault is that? Is it the fault of third? No. Is it the fault of why mummy drinks? No. Is it the fault of that rubbish? No. Is it the fault... Of the Hobbit. Is that the first one? That was the first book, yeah. Yeah? So the first book is to blame, not me. Well, no. No, you've, you've said it's not me. But it is. No, you said it's not me, that's fine, I can hurt you now. No, but like... So you see, the books all fall as a result of other books causing them to fall, cause and effect. But the first book can't fall on its own. It needs something that isn't a book to start all the books falling. Um, something from outside the world of books. Something like me. So if you imagine the books are cause and effect within this universe, then you need a different force, a greater force outside the universe to start the whole thing off. You need a first cause. But does that make any sense? How can there even be a first thing if everything is caused by something else? Oh, it's doing me head in. This is a freaky one to get your head round. But just remember this. Logically, something has to start the whole chain going. You can't have an everlasting, ever, ever receding series of events going right back into infinity. Because that would just be stupid. So what did cause it all? What started it all off? It's God, isn't it? It's got to be. And there are three reasons why it can only be God. Firstly, as we've decided, everything has a cause. 
To have an infinite regression of cause and effect is impossible, so there must be a first cause. Now, the only thing that could possibly have been the first cause is something that needs no cause, because otherwise it wouldn't have been the first cause, would it? Keep up, come on, because if, if it wasn't the first cause, if it needed a cause, then it wouldn't have been the first cause. So it has to be the first cause, literally has to be something that doesn't need a cause. Well, that can only be God, because God is the only thing that is defined as eternal. Remember, eternal, the definition, no beginning and no end. So if nothing beginned God, then he didn't need a cause to begin him. So God must be the first cause, eternal. There you go. Ooh, look at that lovely picture of the Big Bang Theory. What were things like before the Big Bang? Well, the theory states that there was just a tiny little particle in the middle of nothingness, and that particle suddenly began to expand. And it's still expanding. We call it the universe these days. So did things look like that? Just that tiny little particle in the middle of nothingness? Nothing outside the universe. Even time doesn't exist outside the universe. So here's another thought. Whatever caused the Big Bang and, and the first event in the universe must have been something that existed outside time. And again, only God can do that because only God is eternal. And of course, if there is nothing outside the universe, outside the little particle that is to become the universe, that means there's no energy, there's no power, um, no raw materials to, to do stuff with. So whatever caused that massive expansion that we called the Big Bang, it must have been self-powering. And to do that, you'd have to be almost omnipotent. Hmm, I wonder what is omnipotent. Let me have a think. Can I think of anything omnipotent? Oh yeah, God. God's omnipotent, isn't he? So there you go. That is the cosmological argument. Now let's move on to the teleological argument. But before we do, I'm in the mood to make some cake. I have here all the ingredients for a chocolate cake. So what I'm going to do now is add the ingredients a bit of time, starting off with eggs. How many eggs should I put in? I think two eggs. We'll go in and we crack them first, because we don't want crunchy cake. That's one egg is in, and now egg two. Woo! Two little legs, two little leggies in there now. So now I've got to put in some butter, some flour, and some golden. So which goes first, I wonder? Who, who thinks the butter goes first? Yeah. Nobody. You meant to put butter before eggs, but... Butter before eggs, okay. Well, I'll put the butter in second because this is going to be secondary butter cake. Uh, is that enough, do we think, everybody? Yes? No? Yes! Yes. And now, the flour. The flour next, yes, here comes the flour. Just stand. Um, is that enough flour, do we think? That's a lovely amount of flour. And now the golden. What is this even? Golden pasta sugar goes in there next. Woo, about, is that about right, do we think? And now, what, oops, steady. What I've done here is created everything, all the right ingredients are there for a lovely big chocolate cake. So now I'm just going to leave this. And if a chocolate cake can make itself, if all the ingredients just and, and create cake by themselves, then we know that God doesn't exist. If that doesn't happen, um, if we're just left with a manky mess, then we know that God does exist. Because the universe 
It's like big cake, isn't it? The universe is like a cake. All the ingredients are there, but does it need something to put it together? Does it need a chef or a designer? Well, it's later now, maybe even a day or two, and I'm just going to check to see what has happened in my bowl with the cake ingredients that I was trying to make a chocolate cake out of. Let's have a look. This means there's no God, because this is like a, a picnic that's been created. It can just put itself together. In other words, complicated things that, that have a purpose need a, a designer, someone to put it together. Um, cake, admittedly, is not that complicated. Um, so perhaps cake isn't the best example, but, but imagine, imagine cake was as complicated as the universe. Um, and the question is, could a cake put itself together into a cake if all the ingredients just happened to be there? Could a cake do that? Could time and a bit of, a bit of random luck create a cake out of the raw ingredients? Um, if it can, and it happens, then you don't need a god. Uh, you don't need a designer or a chef. But if the cake fails to make itself, then probably you need a chef. And in the same way, the universe needs a god. Because the universe is a complicated thing that needs a designer to put it together. Apparently. Look at it. Look at the world around you now. Look how complicated it is with bananas and and bees and heather and waterfalls and moo cows and oil platforms. The world is an incredibly intricately balanced series of ecosystems and and really, really complicated stuff that I don't understand because I'm just an RE teacher. But I understand this. It works. It does its job, this world of ours. If you acknowledge that its job is to support life, to support the likes of me and you, then the world works perfectly. So you have got a very intricate and complex system that serves a purpose. These things do tend to have designers. What could possibly be powerful enough to design a whole universe? It's got to be God, hasn't it? And, ah, yes, the argument from religious experience. Because there are people out there who claim to have experienced God personally in one way or another. There are those people who who feel that they sense God's presence uh, when looking at something like, I don't know, a religious building, a particularly well-made pie, a beautiful place, looking up at the stars... They get that curious sense that they're in the presence of something greater than them. Um, hey, they say, I, I can feel a bit of the numinous going on here. Um, often described as an experience of something going beyond the normal everyday experience. Then there are those people who pray and meditate and somehow feel that even on their Fisher Price telephone, they've managed to connect to God that way. Some people get all religiously goddy feelings when they see particular works of art in churches or religious paintings. Um, there's that fish finger one again. Um, oh, look at that beautiful stained glass window. Some people are inspired by images like this. And look at these clips. Check them out on YouTube. Glossolalia. 
That's when people at worship are suddenly struck with the power of the Holy Spirit and it makes them talk all funny Holy Spirit language stuff, just like they did on the day of Pentecost. You remember when the followers of Jesus, their, their heads set on fire and they started talking all kind of gobbledygook that everybody seemed to understand? Well, these Christians reckon it still happens to them on a, on a weekly basis in their local church. And then there are people being slain in the spirit when the power of God just overwhelms them so much they fall over. You ask them what's caused that and they will say straight away it's God. God through the power of the Holy Spirit has made me talk like this or fall over. And that for those people is evidence enough of the existence of God. Just like some people simply feel God in nature around them. Look at these lovely pictures of nature. Look at that lovely valley canyon thing, a lovely waterfall, some lovely fish and lovely little fingers. Ooh, a beautiful sunset um, or potentially sunrise. Um, some whales spouting water, puppies and a big crater. There are people who've experienced conversion events when suddenly God appears to them and changes their beliefs completely. And some people say that they, they've experienced miracles. Um, a miracle is an event that has taken place that violates the law of nature and is caused by the power of God. Now, if you see something like that happening, you're going to think, well, yeah, it's against the laws of nature. It's against the physical laws of the universe. God caused it, therefore God must exist. Oh, little activity. Read the following scenarios of how people may believe God exists. After 20 years of playing the lottery and not winning a penny, the night you said a prayer, you had a massive win. Does that prove God exists? You went to Lourdes on a pilgrimage and witnessed your friend being healed of an incurable disease with holy water. Does that prove God exists? Your grandma was dying of cancer. The doctor said that there were no more drugs for her to try. The next day she was cured. Does that prove God exists? You saw an angel in your bedroom last night. Does that prove it? You had a vision of a train crash and it happened a week later. A baby fell from the 16th floor of a tower block and was only bruised. It should have died. A boy had his foot caught on a train track. The train was heading towards him at top speed, slammed its brakes on and stopped within an inch of the child. And you witnessed Jesus turning water into wine and were able to later drink some of the wine. Would you call these things miracles? Were they religious experiences? Draw a unicorn right now. Okay, drawing a unicorn now. Unicorn! Yeah, I reckon I know what you've drawn. Define a unicorn. Go on, write down the definition of a unicorn. I know what you've written. You have drawn and written something along the lines of a horse with a horn on its head. This is the ontological argument and it gets a bit freaky. It's all based on logic. Um, that's an elephant, by the way. I'm going to use this elephant to explain how the ontological argument works. Let's just get rid of it. Oh, he's back. Right. Okay. This is how it works. It is one statement plus another statement equals another statement. Just simple maths. So, Nelly is an elephant. That's one statement. All elephants are pink. That is your second statement. So just to run through that again, 
Nelly is an elephant. All elephants are pink. Therefore, Nelly is pink. That is perfect logic. And that is how this argument works. Put in its most simple form, God must exist because God is perfect. And we know that because that's in the official definition of God, remember. Let me put it another way. God is the greatest thing that you can possibly imagine. You can't possibly imagine anything greater than God. Stop trying. You can't. God is perfect. Perfect means you can't get better than that thing. OK, just excuse me while I enjoy a refreshing beverage. Now, the point of this is to show that as I pour myself an imaginary pint and drink it, as well served as that imaginary pint is, as beautiful as my imaginary pint looks, and I'm very good at serving beautiful imaginary pints, it is still not as good as a real pint. Even if a real pint is a bit dodgy, it's still better than my imaginary pint, because at least the real pint actually exists. OK, let, let's try it another way. Imagine an island like this one. Beautiful, isn't it? Almost like a perfect island, that. Um, but it's not perfect. What it needs is a DW stadium for me to watch um, Wigan Warriors there. Now I'm happier with my island. But it's still not perfect. I know what it's missing. It's missing a transport system. And I love roller coasters, so I've got a roller coaster transport system on my island now. What else does it need? Well, we can make it even better by putting Girls Aloud on there. Um, there they are, just on the beach there. Now, my island's getting better, um, but just Girls Aloud on their own, not really good enough. I also need Sugar Babes too, they're over at the, the north end there, Sugar Babes Bay. But even that doesn't make it the perfect island, because it's still missing a few things, isn't it? Um, let's have another another Nicola from Girls Aloud, because she's my favourite one. Um, now it's a better island, and, and, and another one, and more Nicolas. That's, if I cover my island in Nicolas, that's one on the roller coaster. Lots of Nicolas on my island, and a Twix factory. Now we're talking, and a pub for me to drink in my lovely pints of Wadworth 6X and a discotheque to dance with all my Nicholas. You see, this island is getting better and better and better. I'm thinking, can any island be better than this island? And of course the answer is yes, because this isn't a real island. It doesn't exist. So a real island, like Spike Island here in Widnes, is automatically better than my island, even though it's a bit naff but simply because it exists. A road island is better than my island, just because it exists. Real things are always better than imaginary things. And if God is perfect, that means nothing can be better than him. So in order to be the best, in order to be perfect, he's got to be real as part of what he is. Therefore, God is real. Yeah, that's a dodgy argument, isn't it? We're on more solid ground with the argument from morality. Morality, incidentally, is your sense of right and wrong. It's how you make moral decisions. And when it comes to morality, there are two types of decision making. You could be an absolute moralist. In other words, you think things that are wrong are always wrong and things that are right are always right. And there's never ambiguity in those things. Or you could be a relative moralist and... You say, well, yeah, normally that's a bad thing to do, but in some circumstances it can be a good thing to do. Let's take the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Um, he was an absolute moralist. He felt that um, we all know we've got this innate knowledge of the difference between right and wrong. Therefore, we should always, 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 always do what is right. And there are no circumstances when doing a naughty thing could be doing a, a nice thing. If something is bad, you never ever do it. So, for instance, you shouldn't ever lie under any circumstances. 
So imagine this, imagine your Desi mate comes round to your place, you let them in, um, they say, I'm a bit worried that there might be a, a, an axe murderer after me. And you say, don't worry, don't worry, you go and hide under my bed, everything's fine under there, no axe murderers. And minutes later, there's a knocking at the door, and you open it, and there is a mad axe murderer with an axe at your door, and he says to you, do you know where your best friend is? Well, according to Immanuel Kant, you can't lie, so you'd have to say, yes. And he says, can you tell me, please, where is your best friend? Well, you would have to tell the truth again, because lying would be a bad thing, because lying is always bad. That is absolute morality. But at least as your best friend is being axe murdered to death, you can relax knowing that you did the right thing. To be fair, Kant is an extreme example. Um, he was around in the 18th century. He was a Protestant. Um, and a bit weird. Apparently you could set your clock by him. That's how regular he was. But he came up with the moral argument for the existence of God. He said that throughout humanity and in all corners of the world, every single human being has a, an innate internal knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. We all just know it. We feel it. So where do these feelings of right and wrong come from? Um, there are two theories in Christianity about this. The first is that we believe things are right or wrong because of the things that we see in the Bible and the things we hear from religious leaders Jesus' example, they are all God's way of showing us what is right. And that means that people try to do the right thing because they've seen it in the Bible and they want to go to heaven. And the stuff we're talking about in the Bible are things like the Ten Commandments and all the things that Jesus said. The problem with this is there are also these weird rules in the Bible too, where it says things like, don't plant more than one kind of crop in a field. Don't let cattle graze with other kinds of cattle. Don't wear clothes made of more than one fabric. If you have a dream about another god, you must die. Don't cut your hair or shave. Any person who curses their father or mother must die. If a man cheats on his wife, then he and the woman must die. If a man sleeps with his father's wife, they all must die. If a man sleeps with his wife while she is menstruating, they must be exiled from their people. If a man or woman sleeps with an animal, then the man, woman and the animal must die. People who have flat noses must not go to church. All gay people must die. People who have a different religion must be killed. If you discover a city where they have a different religion, destroy it and kill the people, for they must die. If a priest's daughter is a whore, she must be burned at the stake. Now, all those rules have a couple of things in common. They're all in the Bible and they're all mad. They're completely bonkers. So this idea that we can find goodness from the Bible and use that as our moral code, it is fraught with problems because we can't follow all those rules. There'd be too much death if we tried to do that. Don't cut your hair or shave. Not doing that. Don't wear clothes made of more than one fabric. Call me old fashioned, but I'm not going around in entirely corduroy. Nobody wants to wear corduroy socks. So there are problems with that theory. The second theory is that our knowledge of right and wrong comes directly from God. It's kind of beamed directly into our heads. He's either cunningly planted it within our heads, or we sense it through our link with the creator, who is the source of all good in the world. What we often call this inner knowledge of right and wrong is the conscience. Um, Many people believe that they instinctively know the difference between right and wrong because their conscience tells them. Well, lots of Christians would say that the conscience is actually the voice of God telling them what to do. And that was where Kant was coming from, really. So his argument for the existence of God 
was that God must exist because we have a conscience. We can feel God telling us the right thing to do. And when we do the wrong thing, oh, blimey, don't we feel guilty about it. That's a hot, nasty feeling, that is, guilt. And Kant argued that if God didn't exist, there would be no reason for us to torture ourselves with guilt. Guilt must be a God-given thing. It's God's way of saying, nah, you've been a bit naughty there. And the idea is that this soul-making journey towards goodness that we're on Every day of our lives, trying to avoid guilt, trying to do the right thing, trying to follow our conscious. Even after we die, it continues. And of course, there are lots of examples of Christians doing good things because they're trying to obey their conscience and be as good as they possibly can be. So they're getting involved in, in charities like Oxfam and, and, and organisations like Amnesty International and all that stuff trying to live as responsibly as they possibly can because that is part of their journey to goodness or their journey to God. But again, some of God's behaviour in the Bible is a little bit questionable. There was that business with the Noah and the Ark where God just decides to kill everybody by drowning. And let's face it, drowning's nasty. He could have done a, a kind of Thanos snap and got rid of people that way. That looked fairly painless, didn't it? But no, he drowns people. And he makes a 400-year-old man, who's apparently one of the good people, he makes him build a boat and live in it with his family for months. I mean, where's the nice bit about that? Then there's the wanton and homophobic destruction of the people of Sodom. The story of Job, where God makes a, a bet with the devil and and subjects poor Job to all kinds of horrific things, just for a laugh, seemingly. And the practical joke God played on Abraham, saying, oh yeah, you've got to go and kill your son Isaac. Ha ha, no you don't. That's not very nice. So yeah, I'd say there are some issues with the moral argument for the existence of God. But people say I shouldn't moan too much about it, because God does reveal himself to humans in a number of different ways. Some say he does so through the Bible. They say the Bible is the word of God, it is the living word of God. And different Christians look at the Bible in different ways. There are the fundamentalists who think it is literally the word of God recorded on paper. There are no mistakes in there because God doesn't make mistakes. Um, however, scientists, human beings, they're always making mistakes. So the Bible is what you have to rely on. Because the Bible is always right. So you have to put your trust in the word of God as it is in the Bible. That's what fundamentalists think anyway. There are problems with that. The Bible contradicts itself lots of times. And all those mad rule things that we looked at earlier on. But if you remember when we looked at the Amish people, that's what they believe. They think that they have to follow the Bible literally. That's why they try to live as old fashioned a life as they possibly can. With the horses and that. Oh, blimey, yeah, and the Dutch Reformed Church. They have a fundamentalist view of the Bible, and they used it to justify apartheid in South Africa. But thankfully, not all Christians are fundamentalists when it comes to the Bible. You've got conservatives who see it slightly differently. They think that when the Bible was being written, the people writing it were hugely influenced by the word of God, like God was whispering in their ear, here, come on, write this down. And they did their best to write down what God was telling them. But again, they were human, they were fallible, they got distracted. So sometimes they might have got it a little bit wrong, made a couple of mistakes. But even so, the Bible's still more important because it is the closest thing that we've got to literally the word of God than anything since. So conservatives will still favour the Bible over science. Then you've got the liberals and what they think. They believe that the Bible is a collection of old stories, myths and fables that we can still learn a lot from, but it's largely symbolic. We just have to 
interpret it for ourselves to make it make more sense in the modern world. So that's God revealing himself through the Bible. Christians also believe that God revealed himself through Jesus. In the Gospel of John, it does say that Jesus was the word made flesh. God contacted humans directly by becoming human himself, showing his love, teaching people stuff, um, providing an example for godly living, doing a few miracles and then making the ultimate sacrifice. And the miracles that, that God performed through Jesus are healing miracles, miracles over nature, uh, raising the dead, doing exorcisms. The Bible is full of Jesus doing that stuff and therefore showing people quite clearly that God did exist and was there with them. Remember, a miracle is a physically impossible event that occurs against the normal natural laws of the universe and is performed through the power of God. So miracles in themselves, both in the Bible and in the world today, are examples of God revealing himself to humans. Christians would say God also reveals himself through inspirational people, people like Mother Teresa and George Cadbury. Might be worth finding out a bit about them because they were both devoutly religious people and hugely influential. Who these days hasn't heard of Mother Teresa or Cadbury's chocolate? So just to finish off, how do you know that God is revealing himself to you? Well, here's a quick guide. You know that God is revealing himself to you when there is an unexpected bright light and a lot of falling down. That means you're probably about to go through a conversion event, so brace yourself for impact. You know God is revealing himself to you when you get a strange feeling, a bit like being drunk, but you've not been on the pop. You know God is revealing himself to you when the Holy Spirit sets fire to your head, like at Pentecost. You know God is revealing himself to you when you get a feeling of awe and wonderment. Oh, look at that. Oh. And you know God is revealing himself to you when you start chatting a load of mad stuff. Stuff just coming out of your mouth because the Holy Spirit is doing the talking for you. And if God chooses to reveal himself to you, then surely to goodness you can't argue about the existence of God. Because there it is. So you've got some big questions to answer, some whopping great arguments to have, like, uh, like what is God really? C can we be sure of any of that stuff about what God is? Does it matter if God is a trinity? Three, two, one. Um, does it matter if one part of the trinity is more or less important than the other? Um, does God even exist? I mean, look at those ridiculous arguments that cosmological, the teleological, the ontological, the, the morality argument. Um, do they make any sense whatsoever? And how do any of them work when you've got things like the problem of evil and suffering? I mean, just taking the teleological argument, if the universe has a designer, then that designer has made it so that bad things happen in it. Does that sound like an all-living God? Um, and the same goes for the cosmological argument. God existing outside time creates a universe. When he knows bad things are going to happen, what's that all about? All these big questions, all these, all these massive arguments just waiting to be had. Are there such things as miracles? Is a religious experience good enough evidence to say that God exists? Why would God reveal himself to us? Why would God reveal himself to some people, but not to other people? What's wrong with me, God? There are arguments there to be had. Rip into them.